My name is David Turner. For quite a big part of my life, I've been a war resistor and peace campaigner. Uh, perhaps focusing for, for the middle, middle years in the campaign for nuclear disarmament. Uh, and you know, that might be a thread that runs right through life from very early on. About the 1990s, you may remember the ending of the Cold War as such in 89, uh, and there was great talk of what we called the peace dividend. That, you know, the arms race was effectively over, so what could we look for in a changed uh, kind of world scene? Uh, and of course it didn't happen. <laughs> uh, there was a, a, a brief lull, and then by the, by the middle of 1990s, it was business as usual and the uh, arms uh, manufacture was continuing to rise again. I had been aware of this group called the Campaign Against the Arms Trade because it goes back to about 75, but uh, I either didn't have the time or didn't feel particularly at that time it was necessarily my thing. But uh, it began to come to me very forcibly that here was something I should take an interest in. Uh, and in due course, I felt that I wanted to be more than interested, but active uh, in continuing to learn, but also, you know, taking some part in t helping other people to understand some of the issues. So I joined the campaign against uh, the arms trade at that time, and when the opportunity came to start a little group in Edinburgh, in about the middle of the 1990s, uh, I, I took part in that. A wee bit about Imogen, who's sharing this with me today. Um, I'm Imogen, I'm the current development worker for Edinburgh Campaign Against the Arms Trade. Um, yeah. I've been active on peace and environmental issues since about 2006, when I was living in the south of England. Um, mostly anti-nuclear stuff, because we had the atomic weapons establishment at Aldermaston, very nearby where I lived. And yeah, so I carried on with that through moving up to Scotland. Okay. Well, we're going to kind of retreat from the, the, the campaigning uh, focus today uh, because we're here and we're very really glad to take part in something which is about uh, learning and sharing. Uh, and we're not here for a hard sell. The people want to know something about the campaign at a later point. That's absolutely fine, but there's no pressures to, to take it any further than you know this discussion itself, which will be an important thing, uh, is to you know just get <coughs> thoughts moving on it. Uh, in order to do that, we want to present a number of things that are called facts. Uh, I think most of them are verifiable, so that it's not a question of uh, I've invented them for today's uh, meeting. Uh, and then, uh, you know, questions that might ar ar arise from these facts. I'm very conscious of the fact that nobody knows all the facts about any subject. That we're inevitably, we're selective. Uh, we select something uh, which is meaningful to us, uh, which we can contain within our limited heads, uh, and we take it from there for what kind of interpretations we might want to make of them. So I'm very open to facts that other people have which uh, perhaps might seem to be uh, in opposition or you have to be placed alongside my facts in order to look at a, a wider picture. Uh, I feel very open to being challenged uh, on, on anything that you feel uh, arises from your, your understandings of the facts. So on that basis I think we'll, we'll probably just go ahead. The, one of the things which I felt was interesting maybe to do was to talk a bit about the global picture uh, and to start off with that. From the United Nations we have some figures which suggest that the total military spending uh, at the present is about seven billion dollars a week. Uh, but it's rising. Uh, and of that possibly 20-25% is in the buying and selling side of it. The others are simply uh, what countries produce or manufacture in order to meet their own need, national needs, whatever they may be. But there's another UN report which you know, sets a kind of interesting comparison with that, and it says that the global provision of food, water, education, sanitation, housing, for all who are in serious want, would be around that same figure. So it's just a kind of comparison of how we, how we actually choose to use the resources of the world today. Uh, that kind of contrast sometimes makes us feel a bit numb. 
Uh, and like these, the, the, the height of these figures, and I think that's very natural, and particularly if we're thinking, you know, about even saying how would we ever tackle this head on? It's totally, totally beyond us. Mm -hmm. I think what we can at least think about, though, is what might be contributing to it, and which we might be able to change given the political will which might be needed for that. And I acknowledge that many people are actually trying to address some of the contributory factors whole range of organisations uh, bringing their understandings to this question uh, which we are on about today. And uh, the issues are really you know, bound up with so many others that uh, we have to say that these things are independent. We can't wholly isolate one from the other. But what we're trying to do today, though, because this is what we're about today, is what part the arms trade plays and see if we can tease that out a bit. I would say, first of all, it was not about national defence, not because that's not an important issue. In fact, some of us have strong views about that and the extent to which we're involved in that. But I want to distinguish that because it's a different argument. What we're talking about today is the arms trade, the buying and selling of weapons worldwide. And it's going to have an informed discussion about anything we need to have. Uh, we need to be able to trust certain things, such as the evidence which has been put before us. And that includes the buyers and the sellers, the items that are being traded, for what purpose, what regulations and controls exist, how the business is justified, and what might be driving it that isn't publicly acknowledged. It's an enormous area of study, so we're only really looking at the outlines of it today, so that we can begin to shape our understanding of it uh, and perhaps look at it uh, from a range of points of view. So we'll have questions and discussion, uh, but that can be easily interspersed with simply bringing something up that you want clarified at the time, rather than say we'll hold all that till the end and then probably forgotten it by that time. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very happy to be interrupted. Uh, and uh, if I don't know the answer, I'll, I'll tell you and see whether anybody else here knows the answer. Mm -hmm. So, a little bit about who are the big players on the arms front. The, the big ones are the five members of the Security Council, the USA, UK, Russia, France and China. And they uh, have got 75% of the world market. There are two coming up quite fast among the smaller players, Germany and Israel, who are both uh, increasing their share. But it's still, we're talking about three quarters of it all is the, the Security Council people who technically are there to keep the peace of the world. Uh, and they sell, well, the UK is somewhere around second or third place. It varies a little bit from time to time. We're certainly high up in, in the League of the Five. And we sell to about 60 countries worldwide. And some of these are democratic, some are authoritarian in various degrees. What do we sell? Well, warships, fighter aircraft, submarines, helicopters, missiles and missile delivery systems, drones, which are now, have drones are these uh, unmanned aircraft, which we've been hearing more about. Mm -hmm. uh, used to be for surveillance, now carry bombs, and uh, somebody in Nevada presses a button and the bomb drops in Afghanistan. Can I interrupt and ask a question as you invited? Sure. Where are these weapons made? Where the weapons are made? ones I'm talking about yes. are made in UK. We're, talk, made in we're UK. talking about UK manufacturers. Okay, in this, UK manufacturers. In this particular yeah, case. Okay. We, we do all that stuff. I just yeah. wondered if the argument that it's creating jobs could be used, and it obviously can be used. Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, then, the, well, there were tanks included in that. That's the big stuff. And that's no use for anything except wars or whatever. But then there's the, the armoured vehicles, things like machine guns, rifles, ammunition, security equipment, such as tear gas and battering rams, oddly enough, razor wire uh, and riot gear. Uh, and these are not much use in war, but they're ideal when uh, a country wants to uh, cut down on the protests with its own people who can be used for that. Uh, the, who are the big players here, the, the big buyers rather? 
uh, oil-rich states like Saudi Arabia and the uh, United Arab Republics are, are among those who really buy big, big items. Uh, for uh, the, the very often that these are part of what we might call the, the, the UK or NATO military bases uh, in the Far East and South Pacific. And it's these very big, big things that help to keep the UK trade afloat. So our arms promoting uh, teams of government ministers and uh, trade, armed trade representatives, diplomatic personnel visit them frequently. Uh, very recently to India and recently south, and to South Arabia. But they're roaming around now some of the countries like Egypt and others which are changing their regimes and which are about to be a possible new market. Market, looking for markets. Africa has always been a valued market and has, for a long time, was about 60% of UK trade at one time. I think it's diminished a bit. China is moving in there very rapidly. Mm -hmm. Only South Africa, of Africa, buys really heavy stuff, and one of them is submarines. And <laughs> sometimes it can be quite strange. What, what does South Africa need to be defended against if it needs South submarines? <laughs> uh, there you are. It's as well to remember that Africa, South Africa is a very, very poor country with lots and lots of people who are in terrible circumstances, but they choose to get submarines. So others in Africa buy mainly small arms, which is include quite a number of these things, but it couldn't anything up to the level of armoured vehicles. And it's these that cost the most, cause the most casualties among civilians. And they very easily cross national boundaries. Uh, and they often found the arms from what we call the respectable selling countries found up in the hands of militias and even child soldiers. Now that's just a very brief outline of how the trade operates uh, from this country, but there's more of interest to there are one or two bits around here that would perhaps add to that if you want to. <coughs> so what uh, uh, controls and regulation uh, is there on this, in this country? There's always been some. Uh, I don't know just what form it took way back in the kind of middle uh, 20th century, but certainly since about the 80s uh, onwards, uh, there's been a, an attempt to try and formulate controls that would uh, be reasonably, reasonably robust. But uh, there was a period, and particularly when the Labour Party came to power in 1997, to look again at these, uh, these rules. And I think it was uh, Robin Cook who devised what he called the ethical foreign policy. Uh, and in terms of that, the controls on, on export of arms were tightened up uh, and uh, they, then there was a question of how can we align these with other countries in Europe because we were continually knowing that we're very much part of Europe uh, and it turned out eventually that our arms controls were fairly consistent with European ones and what's called a European common policy on arms transfer. We, we, we run more or less with that. We have a licensing committee which is made up of a uh, selection of MPs from the, the major parties uh, and the, the composition uh, changes from time to time, uh, but I would imagine that perhaps there are certain members of parliament who would not be invited onto the licensing committee, mm -hmm. uh, but that's speculation rather than fact. The, the, the criteria for arms sales, there are nine of them, uh, and I'm not going to deal with them all, but mainly with three of them, which uh, are perhaps the most important ones and the ones that most of all come up. Well, I'll just spend a minute or two on that because I think it's quite important. I'll just mention what the three of them are. Criterion to the respect of human rights and fundamental freedoms in the country of destination. Not, would not issue an export license if there's a clear risk that the proposed export might be used for internal repression. Uh, and the second one was the government will not issue a license for exports which provoke, provoke or prolong armed conflicts or aggravate existing 
tensions or conflicts in the country or final destination. Uh, on the third major one, <coughs> the compatibility of the arms exports with the technical and economic capacity of the recipient country, taking into account the desirability that states should achieve the legitimate needs of security and defence with the least diversion for armaments of human and of armaments of human and economic resources. So that, that comes up into the, the major things which so often I think are, are what we judge our arms exports on. I think uh, we've got to look at really what the reality is of that. On internal repression, which is one of the major things, the government's own Human Rights Select Committee, uh, which is a kind of watchdog body, names 26 countries which are a serious concern on human rights. This is over the last decade. In that period, the UK sold to 16 of these, which included Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, South Arabia, Israel, Sri Lanka and Colombia. The defence of that against people who have criticised it is that the kind of uh, arms that we actually exported to these countries are not the type which could be used for internal repression. Uh, whether that or not is true in some cases, it's been shown to be quite untrue in others. And Libya is a good example. Where up until 2010, we were supplying them with arms of all kinds, security equipment of some of the kinds we've been mentioning, and also we were training their army. The other defence is that well, we are yes, we all make mistakes, uh, misjudgments were made, lessons are learned, but uh, still to now, Bahrain, South Arabia, Southern Arabia, and uh, Israel are still getting armies from Britain. Uh, yes. On areas of conflict, that was another part. There's a body called the Stockholm Peace Research Institute, and it has named 16 states which are in areas of major armed conflict. The UK sold to 12 of these, including both sides in certain places, like India, Pakistan, Ethiopia, Eritrea. And the third one is the, what the economic impact, should, could it be justified in, in the light of these countries' economic situation? Well, we sent, we granted licenses to Malawi, Kenya, Angola, Indonesia. Indonesia has billions of debt from past arms loans and we find it difficult to pay them. And these are also in conflict zones or were very recently. Certainly they've got a desperate, desperate problems of poverty. There's a letter from my MP which is in response to a question I asked, which I think is quite illuminating. Uh, she talks about uh, the Committee on Arms Exports Controls. This, this is a, another body which oversees you know, what we're selling. It published a report in April 2011 which called into question the government's record on the application of the criteria. Uh, and uh, the Commission's report said, while the consolidated criteria appear robust, their application seems to be less so. We therefore recommend that the government ensures that the UK UE common position is rigidly and consistently applied. The government's response to that, the government does not accept that there is any evidence that the UK application of the criteria is in any way less robust than the EU common position. There was recently a statement by an MP, some of you may have heard of him, it goes back a bit, though. now uh, Sir John Stanley at one time a defence minister, I think in the 1980s, and a very staunch member of the establishment at the time, and he has said very recently that a policy of maximising arms exports, which is what our present government say they want to do, want to increase our share of them, policy of maximisation is incompatible with human rights. Well, so that's not just one of us saying it, <laughs> it's one of them. Mm -hmm. 
Any questions on that or you know, comments on that before we'll I just move on to the next bit, which is the justifications which are made for the trade? I don't understand the government at all because, you know, they, they keep saying, you know, we're, we're going to cut back on the, the, the forces, armed forces, yeah. Cut back on? Yeah. Or yeah. Cut back on what? Armed forces. Armed forces. forces. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And yet, you know, they're still wanting uh, recruits and that, you know. Mm -hmm. It would appear certainly that there, there, there's some reduction of money for defence, mm -hmm. but there doesn't seem to be any reduction in the subsidies given to uh, companies who are selling arms. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard any way there is any reduction in that. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Let's say that, um, that there are, that the, there are uh, restrictions on the terms that arms can be sold under, yeah. yet these terms are violated, it seems, with other information. So why do they get away with it? Who's mm -hmm. supposed to be overseeing that process? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> uh, like the the, these watchdog bodies mm -hmm. are supposed to oversee it. But the trouble is that they come in after the event. Uh, that's one thing my MP has said to me. Uh, uh, if I had been around when that was happening, I would have complained. But I could have equally said to her, yes, you could have complained, but it would have already happened by that time. <laughs> you know, it, there's no way in which anybody can challenge the licensing committee's uh, uh, decisions at this stage. But can't they be um, punished? Uh, you know, if they have violated the rules, can they not then be fined an enormous sum or mm -hmm. some other sort of... Uh, there doesn't seem to be any process at so all. So they get away with it, They could more or less. They could be, I say, these uh, advisory watchdog bodies could, uh, could wrap their knuckles and say, you need to watch it. You know, obviously, you know, you're you either on the very borderlines of things or else you're going right over them. But then uh, they, what they would then say is, we, we take your point, and, you know, but then it continues and so on. It brings to mind uh, the old expression, who guards the guards? Mm. Uh, mm. Yes, yes. Uh, something I'm wondering is, uh, I, I'm thinking of Eisenhower's address when he stepped down as a military leader, and uh, how, how, we, how do we re, uh, refocus the military industrial complex mm -hmm. towards something that, that's proactive? I mean, I, I, one proud moment in life was I remember that there was a tremendous earthquake and uh, I, uh, the only people who could respond to this the huge disaster was, was the military mm -hmm. and they went in and they did a really great job and I imagine that's one of the best nights sweet. Yeah. But uh, yeah, how, how repurposable is the technology? Oh, yeah. If if uh, if we're thinking on uh, you know about dealing with uh, relatively unphilosophical minds, undeveloped minds, you know, well, let's sell bombs because we make money. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we've got to take a, a, a social constructivist approach and go well. You could make even more money by doing. Uh, using this technology mm. in this way. Yeah. Yeah. It comes to mind uh, the prefabricated houses built in aircraft factories yeah. with aircraft technology. Handy mm. page of the oh, uh, Halifax bomber, etc. The same machinery. Now, I, when I lived in Stafford, there were still a few of these prefabs left. Mm. Mm. Uh, they were only tended for about 10 years, but that was, oh, how many, 50 years? Mm. Nigh on, oh, uh, 40 years. Uh, now, by extension, I knew also another interesting thing. An armaments factory in London called Woolwich Arsenal built steam locomotives, and one or two are still laying on private railways, mm -hmm. uh, uh, to keep the workmen busy. Mm -hmm. uh, the factory uh, carried on uh, making steam locomotives to the design of a mm -hmm. southeastern railway, and uh, I think of several other similar examples mm -hmm. of. Uh, German firms, Krupp, uh, the armaments firm, of course, made steam engines, and Nordic, hundreds of thousands of them. So why shouldn't firms uh, build those Australian-made caissons that intercept the waves that 
would cross coastal erosion in East Anglia, mm -hmm. it was all a new scientist. A uh, whole chain of caissons along the low lying coasts of Britain mm -hmm. to protect the counties like Norfolk ending up in Davy Jones' locker. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is far more urgent than any foreign foe is writing. See, Montrose will end up in Davy Jones' locker. Mm -hmm. You know where it is, on his mm -hmm. no sand spit. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I have written a social science fiction novel about uh, far in the future of a line of caissons right round from berwick on tweed right round to Devon uh, and generating all the electricity Britain needs mm -hmm. by the waves and wind turbines mm -hmm. attached to them so that Britain is no combustion apart from some more uh, preserved railways and a few uh, haddock smokeries, you know, smoked haddock places in our growth. Uh, apart from that, no combustion whatsoever, everything uh, and the low-lying places, I mean, think of half of East of Norfolk, uh, about one man height, it would be in Davy Jones's locker. Mm -hmm. Can anybody comment on those observations? Well, I think it's, uh, I think that's the way, the only way we can go forward mm -hmm. is to divert the technology into good uses, mm -hmm. because you can't stop you, the argument that just uh, withdraw the whole industry is not going to work, but if, you, if a good argument can be put up and, and demonstrated that um, that technology can be diverted into good uses, mm. then it seems to me that that is the way we have to go forward. Mm. It, it's the only way, really. Mm. I mean, it's the old thing, plowshares in art, uh, what is it? Yeah, yes. you know, it's it's yeah. I mean, that has to be done, mm. it seems to me. I mean, Anybody who's been campaigning against the evils of the world comes to a point where you feel you're overwhelmed by it. Mm, yeah. You're overwhelmed by it. Yeah, right. But I think we're at the point in history now where we have to realise that that we can't be overwhelmed and we must find new solutions. Uh, and it's not just a matter of stop. It's a matter <coughs> of divert mm. and see that there is a future in a different way that is more compatible mm to the well-being of all of us. And the point we're at now in history with the internet and globalization and everything mm -hmm. is that we are beginning to realize that all our destinies are shared and united. So yeah, there is, is you know, I think yeah. people's minds just had that little shift. And if we all contribute towards um, persuading or enlightening people in our own different ways, I'm a writer, mm -hmm. sense you, yeah, I'm writing yeah. little zines and everything. Yes, I've been standing back now and sort of, I was a protest for years, and I've sort of been, oh, it's all too much for me. Mm. But um, we have to think of new ways to combat these mm. evils. Mm. And I think diversion of technology. Well, you, you, you're stealing my language, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not until the people, ordinary people start, you know, everyone through the world starts yeah. to hate, and I said, only way it's ever going to happen. Absolutely. You know, it's the only way. Uh, I know David Seaver, a uh, social science fiction writer, not science fiction, and there's no Martians, there are Scots on Mars, and they're Presbyterians, so the last man and woman. <laughs> it's a story of mine called Never Let Your Sanders Step, which is about uh, a, a man from our killing goes to Mars, to the Martian killing, to mm. broadcast the ch children of Mars about Elizabeth II's second society, our society, film clips of uh, dissoluteness in Glasgow and Edinburgh. Uh, warning, this is horror, you know, people being assaulted, football rises, the expenses scandal, all that, mm -hmm. uh, as a uh, future, uh, looking back upon it from two centuries ahead, mm -hmm. uh, I've written about a Russian guy called Roman oh, Rickon, who uh, said to, Brit to Scotland, by courtesy of the King of Scotland, uh, and he goes, he goes, uh, so the film of Scotland for noble power achievement, that is namely the caissons offshore, mm. uh, the wave power stations, the wind power stations, <laughs> the tidal barrages across the Clyde, and a right to transmit in Moscow. See, that's what I mean. Mm. Now that's uh, back in the future. Do, do you and mm. lady, mm. would you agree with that? Yes, I'll oh, provide copies. Well, I think, I think it's lovely to Vision project is. forward into the future because sometimes it sounds as if it might be better than the than what's now. No, we never know. Anyway, thank you for that. I'm feeling as if we're putting a lot more money into you know, the, the vehicles in Af Afghanistan and that with the, the IEDs. You know, so they're making the structure, you know, 
uh, blaasproef van de lief. Dat is dat we al wat mannen laat bij alleen de leden van de zeven de soorten vijfs die nog zijn. Maar mijn eigen idee is al. Ik heb wel veel, je weet het niet. Ik Thank you, Stars. These are things that are being swapped around in the Elm Street. They're sold, they're bought and sold. Yeah. The Americans are bent on world domination now, that's exactly what they're planning for. I'm going to tell you, I don't know if anybody watches our TV for you today. Oh, a good friend of mine keeps recommending it to me. Yeah, I've been watching a talk in the American media about the Armed Forces. I see the Americans are planning to go to war with China in 20 years' time. And Russia, but the most of the region. Mm. Yeah, that's where they've, they've got a part of them, got 250,000 uh, people on all the different air bases throughout the world. And they're, they're increasing them, especially mm. where Russia are getting very worried now. Mm. They're thinking of even uh, coming out of the, the arms agreements, and the nuclear arms agreements, so the same with America. So mm. they think of even just forgetting about that. They don't, trust, they don't trust America anymore. They've also got the uh, NBC. Uh, nuclear biological chemical warfare, myself as well, all over the world, yeah. mm -hmm. which is a bit scary, you know. I, I'd like to really um, well, move, uh, move on with uh, some of the more, some more of the, the points that you've Well, got fair enough, yes. I, mean, uh, I think probably it was inevitably that people here would be ahead of me. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Uh, that may just maybe a word about uh, you know, what some of the justifications are, and pre these are things which are probably not uh, any news to you. But the very often, the, one of the objections to, uh, for instance, the kind of campaigns that we bring forward is that, yes, I know, but let's think about the jobs involved. And some of you have been, t uh, what you've been saying is relevant to that. But j just to put it in perspective, that arms-related arms jobs are just point two. 0.2 percent of the UK workforce, uh, and 1.5 percent of all UK manufacturing. You know, is that's the, the volume of it, and it's shrinking. Less than half uh, the number are employed in the arms trade uh, firms than in the 1990s. So it's going down. Just recently, the BA systems made redundant 3,000 <coughs> people in England. Uh, and it's a, a, a rather unpleasant reflection that supposing a major arms company like BA System decide to relocate, as they are doing the, the bit anyway, more than half of their business is now in America. If they decide to relocate, it would obviously devastate the communities of Fife and Edinburgh who depend on arms, you know, the arms trade. Uh, it, would be, it would be catastrophic. So, uh, you know, that's, that reinforces what we've been saying about the need to look at uh, alternatives. And that renewable energy uh, companies are among those who are crying out for any one of these common skills that are, we have with, uh, with arms trade. There's about 30 commonly recognised skills that are, you know, can be used for a wide range of other industries as well as the arms trade. A recent report suggests that 82,000 engineers, technicians and scientists are needed by civil industries, which are emerging now, which uh, that would include some of what you've been talking about. So that's the job side. The other, uh, the, these are government defences often, though you find as we're out on the streets talking to people very often, more oh, the jobs, you know, the jobs. But I say putting it in perspective is important, and far more serious structural changes have been handled in Britain over the last 30 years. The other one is economic benefit, and it's another one that really needs to be questioned. First of all, how do we measure it? If we measure it simply in kind of balance sheet terms of profit and loss, the government has never come up with any figures which really show that you know, uh, uh, on that measure, we, we gain from the arms trade. If they have such figures, they have not reduced, released them. Um, very reputed economists are very much divided about the question of whether there's any economic benefit. Bearing in mind the fact that we give about three quarters of a billion in subsidies to the arms trade every year. Uh, so that's, it's a, there's so many, you might call it, in things that you can't define about benefit because it depends which you want to use in order to bolster your case one way or the other. 
Basically, it says that we taxpayers are handing money, hand over fish, to armed factories, uh, firms, who are not even producing these things in Britain. Mm. But I hear that the armed forces have received inferior uniforms and other equipment from overseas, mm. uh, army boots made in Portugal that disintegrate after a week yeah. in Afghanistan, and whilst a factory producing things like that was shut down, a uh, sort of story oh, yes, it's 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 the uh, hands of officers of the armed forces who have shareholdings in armed firms uh, and spend the money on wine. So that's what my friend told me. Well, maybe we can share this spend it worse, I don't know. <laughs> but is there a, one of the wider context for economic benefit? And Eisenhower, very interestingly enough, you've been mentioning him, one of the things he said after he had left his official post was that every warship launched, every helicopter made, every bullet fired is a theft from the poor and the hungry and the homeless. Not exactly a pacifist. <laughs> he was looking at it from a point of view of the realities of life. That's what it means. Mm -hmm. It goes, come, goes on one, it can't go on the other. So uh, maybe that goes back to my first words about the contrast between global world spending and what actually people need rather than, than the arms. And so in, a, in an interdependent world economy, which has got finite resources, is the buying and the selling of arms a profit and loss or loss in terms of, of simply human well-being. And you've been answering that yourself, I think. But it's an important yardstick, human well-being, rather than profit and loss. Human loss. The, 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 the third one, the, perhaps one that was perhaps is again most pushed for, is that we need the arms trade because it's part of <coughs> our national security. It's not very clear what part the arms trade plays in our national security. We can say, well, okay, we build stuff for our defence, and, you know, fair enough. So what are the threats to our security today? What do people feel are the threats to Britain? Where do they come from? Britain and the Western world themselves that are creating all these wars and killing all these people, and that's going to rebound on us. Mm -hmm. you know, obviously, it's going to fuel people's anger and hatred towards us. Mm -hmm. It's as simple as that. But it would be relatively straightforward for a uh, malevolent uh, external agency to uh, commit an atrocity on a colossal scale like chucking a dirty bomb into the Staines reservoirs as sort of minor atomic explosion, steam, radioactivity, a London drenched with radioactivity, people soaking it, people drinking, tap water is not fit to drink, Dying of radiation poisoning because the water supply is contaminated. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I mean, stage reservoirs will supply London. And now, uh, I've, just, <coughs> I've written stories about just that happening. Uh, a small suitcase sized atom bomb uh, lobbed into, oh, well, not like an atom bomb as such, not a Hiroshima bomb, but one that uh, causes the radioactive stuff to burn, mm -hmm. and the outcome is something like. Uh, corsic soda that gets into people's lungs and burns uh, chemically corrosive and uh, radioactive as well in the water supply. Mm -hmm. And uh, London is drenched mm -hmm. from head to toe with radioactivity mm -hmm. and uh, people are dying of radiation poisoning by the 100,000. Can we see any way in which the arms trade would protect us from that? I can't see how. Mm -hmm. They're actually mm -hmm. encouraging it, mm -hmm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's often, people would normally say, well, maybe it's just terrorist threat, that's the thing that most real, you know, etc. But again, <coughs> what can protect us from that of the selling big stuff to places in the Far East? Stop. Stop. Mm. Well, well, that's yeah. the fact that I think it probably makes us more of a target, and the fact that we've got Vaseline and everything. I mean, when I grew up, you were very, very scared of the Russians, let's yeah, say, that's that's right. the I mean, I, I used to sell, like, peace news and things on the street, and people would spit on you really spit on you. That's because of the propaganda yeah. in the media. And I mean, one of the things about the world, I think, is the fact that people are much greedier than they used to be. Yeah. And if, unless we can change that whole mentality, because plenty of people are quite happy for it all to still go on. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I think you're talking pie in the sky if you think anything will be done very fast. Because you know, I've been yeah. doing this since back in the 60s and it just doesn't. Um, 
I mean, a lot, but I, I don't think they help us at all defence-wise, mm. quite frankly. I mean, having fast lane there, it's one of the first things they'd hit, the fourth bridge, places like that. I mean, you know, mm. you just have to hit Scotland, Scotland in a couple of places and we're all gone. Mm. And I mean, the Street does not protect us from that. Mm. The any spin out and bomb went off. So, uh, uh, if an accident did pass rain, the obvious mm. outcome would be radioactive rain mm. drenching uh, the central belt. Mm -hmm. uh, on, born on the westerly winds, uh, assuming that there was a, not an atomic explosion per se, but merely an uh, explosion of high explosives, mm -hmm. the stuff that makes an atom go off is like caustic soda. It, it, in, it's around the powder when uh, you heat it, like caustic soda and another substance in the school lab. But it's all thought from the atmosphere, that's why they had to set down to our compromise to be dehydrated. Now this stuff uh, becomes fine dust that gets into people's lungs, and it is not only corrosive and radioactive. Plutonium hydroxide, uh, exactly like the properties of the caustic soda and uh, similar substances. The plutonium is a chemical of the same family as sodium and potassium. And this radioactive rain would simply bucket down d but right across the populated part of Scotland, as far as Aberdeen and on across to the continent. Yeah. Uh, as I was saying, the Scottish population would be would very be, easy I would say that something really like very 3 million easy. people would die of radioactive mm -hmm. dust uh, 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 poisoning, uh, radi uh, radiation poisoning. Remember that famous film, On the Beach, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 1964, a, a nuclear war, everybody died of radioactive poisoning, mm -hmm. including people in Australia. Mm -hmm. I was a boy at the time and I had nightmares. And mm -hmm. my religious knowledge teacher uh, told us all about atom bombs, that's when I became a CND supporter. Mm -hmm. That's a good old canon Norwood. Well, I think it sounds like a kind of consensus here that national security is not a terribly it's good not, uh, uh, argument. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. Uh, this may be my kind of last section is on, you know, how, how in fact uh, the, the arms trade. What may be driving forces apart from these? Are there some that I think we feel don't stand up? What might be some of the real driving forces for it? Uh, and uh, just say one or two things that come off the cuff from government people, not when they don't think anybody else is particularly listening too much, but some of them have lately have been that the arms trade is a part of the projection of UK power and influence on the world stage. So the trade seen as a political agenda of kind of prestige and status for the, for the UK and the world. More arms, more global cloud. The other one is the way of thinking, because it's that way of thinking, you know, that, that has to be changed, which is very difficult. Very difficult. Yeah, very because difficult. And that's what all the big nations say, isn't it? So, it's all about power, prestige, what other countries think. But it really helps to know what we're really up against yeah. here because that's <coughs> something then we have got to find ways of counting yeah. rather than trying to persuade people that it's not the national security or mm. some of it, or jobs. Mm. We've got to say but other underlying mo uh, motivations. Yeah. It's, it's basically the biggest money making business in the world, isn't it? Well, mm. well of course that's it's a yeah, yeah. for money making for those who yeah. benefit, shareholders mm. and armed companies would be a very main mm. thing. Yeah. There's the exceptional closeness of the government and arms companies. I don't know if you remember, but there used to be a bit of a joke when Tony Blair was in power that the BAE chief executive always had a key to the back door of number 10. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, somebody else said, oh no, no, that's not true. Mm. It doesn't even need that because Tony's at the door waving him in the front door. <laughs> Well, take that as you like, but I think really there's some a little truth behind it that this exceptional closeness of the arms trade right at the heart of government is a very, very unhealthy thing which uh, we really have got to take into account. Mm. It's, it's, uh, it's, should any one industry have a unique influence, and particularly an arms industry, which is not producing something that benefits humanity compared with the vast amount of activity manufacturing that does benefit it. And 140 civil servants are involved in promoting the arms trade. 140. 128 are involved in all other uh, non-military sectors combined. That's all else of you. And yet, I'll say the arms industry is 1.5 of total manufacturing. 
I think about aircraft, I don't know any of the old people remember them. Britain built the Comet, the world's first successful jet I know that. And actually the old the Nimrod plane went into the with a modified Comet. And Britain built a VC ten and other airliners. I saw them in action at air shows when I was a young man. Now Britain stopped building airliners. It, there had been uh, attempts to uh, um, design better airliners and Boeings, uh, and been in the new scientists, uh, uh, engineers have proposed that Britain should build um, airliners as good as the ones are made in America. Mm. But did the government back the uh, BC-10? Uh, a number of airplanes I saw in action as a young man, uh, uh, which were just one-off prototypes. Mm. Uh, no, it did not. Had Britain built uh, airliners, continued to build airliners, we could have outdone the Americans, mm -hmm. or for example, the Airbus yes, company. So these are choices that have been mm -hmm. made at some point. Same, the the same yeah. factories that produced fighter planes could have built uh, uh, flying wing airliners to a British mm -hmm. patent design mm -hmm. that would carry 500 people. And I mean, I, as a boy, I saw them flying. I saw an uh, air, um, aircraft on the pits of Southampton, mm -hmm. a, a half scale model of a vertical takeoff airliner called a Rotodyne. Mm -hmm. And I got stuck with it. When I was a young man, I went to Southampton. Uh, it was given to the Boy Scouts mm. uh, uh, because nobody wanted it anymore. It was on the cliffs in the central Southampton. Mm. Now, this plane could have gone up and off to Paris and got there in an hour flat. Mm. And the government didn't back it. Mm. And there were other inventions that we had. Uh, uh, were shown at invention fairs in London, as I saw, including electric bicycles uh, that across London for tenders for other use. Uh, and Britain didn't back them. Uh, medical inventions, including one that used condoms, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, which uh, was invented by a technician at the London Hospital, uh, we could have manufactured to give the world, but the government didn't back them. Yes, that's right. There is a choice, political choices that <coughs> were made. And uh, again, I think probably influenced by the, uh, the tremendous power that arms companies have always had and which they still seem to have diminished. Uh, this, the final point on that was that uh, there was something called, you might call the revolving door of senior political people and military people uh, and arms company people who move swiftly from job to job when they lose or at least when they leave one job for one, one reason or another they move quickly into another career in one of these other but this makes up a very solidly entrenched establishment, which is so, so hard to challenge. And I think it's that kind of power in the total military establishment, which has been behind the choices made over a long period of 50 years about what we really should invest in. Is this not really dealing with the secret society as a control of Well, it's secret up to a point, but it's been exposed. Yeah, yeah, a study done a little while ago there which indicated that over the last five years 60, 60 major figures in these three sectors that all to do with defence have moved from job to job. Uh, so that's so, so hard. It's a very entrenched thing. These people are also of the same class, same education background, uh, same social circles. They move all the time in a, in a tight circle. Uh, and that's unique. There is no other industry who's got that kind of entrenched thing there. Which, why would any of them ever question the status quo? Exactly.